PowerPoint, and I said I'm, I'm preaching on wedding pictures. And it's the, bar- the parable of Jesus um, uh, that Jesus tells about the, the great wedding feast. And he said, what if we could get every, all of the staff's wedding pictures? And I'm like, are you sure that's a good idea, Phil? <laughs> he's, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I told him, I thought I'd gotten away with it because like Thursday evening, like right before time to go, I said, I forgot to bring you my wedding picture. And he goes, that's all right. I texted Lisa. She's taking care of it. So, yeah, anyway, so here we all are. Uh, <laughs> gosh. Yeah, that's back when all my hair was still dark. Back when Bob still had hair. Uh, one of the few pictures I've ever, you know, one of the few times I've seen Trey actually look serious. Uh, so, and Phil, I, I got to ask, what's the deal with the leisure suit tuxedo thing going on? That's like a flash from the 70s. What, like when was your, when did y'all get married? 80. So you were just like, like one, one click back in the 70s. Because I'm, uh, I'm polyester. Uh, good. And the ruffledy. See, I, when my sisters got married, they had they all of the groomsmen had the the flowery tuxedo thing, and I said something to Lisa about it because I don't I had not attended a lot of weddings other than my sister, and she's like, "No, that went out of style twenty years ago. We're not doing that. We got married in '96, so I just had the our colors were black and white. So yeah, it was a what." Yeah, the, the colors, the colors. You better watch out. You're going to get my wife on you. You start talking about her wedding colors. You're, you're fixing to see a tiger come to life in a minute, man. Okay, take that thing off. We've seen enough of that. Enough of that. It's fun, fun. Fun's over. I'm going to preach about hell now. So, no, I'm just kidding. Not really. All right. Oh, turn to Matthew chapter 22. We're having too much fun on a Sunday night. Matthew 22. All right, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Wedding pictures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again, for your word and the chance to preach it tonight, God. I just pray that you'd be with me tonight and speak to me and speak through me, Lord, what you want me to say tonight, God. Show us Jesus, Lord, and Lord, break break open this wonderful parable for us tonight, Lord, that we might see your love and your grace, your mercy, our opportunity, but also our responsibility, God. I I love you, God, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 
Jesus here is telling parables about the coming kingdom of God. He often does that. He uses he, he he often uses parables <clears throat> to try to explain uh, in terms and ways and pictures that people can understand uh, about about the kingdom of God. And here he uses a picture. Uh, a story of a great wedding feast to talk about the kingdom of God. And he pulls out many different aspects of this great wedding that I just kind of want us to just take a little bit and just kind of dissect this a little bit and kind of unpackage this parable that Jesus tells and see see the, the point that he's making with it. And so we're going to look at aspects of the great wedding tonight, aspects of the great wedding and the first thing that Jesus talks about in his parable is is the preparation <clears throat> the preparation now there are many different characters in Jesus's parable and really to understand what Jesus is talking about we have to understand who these characters represent and so he starts out his uh, uh, parable by talking about that there's a kingdom uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king and in the parable, the king is supposed to represent God the Father. So the, the king in the story is God the Father. And then Jesus, as he tells his story, I'm in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. So it's pretty obvious if the king represents God the Father, then the son would represent G. Uh, I mean, if, yeah, I think I talked ahead of myself. If the king represents God the Father, then the Son would represent Jesus, um, God's Son. And then he, he, in the story, in the parable, he says that the king sends out servants uh, to, uh, to go and tell those, all those that were invited to the wedding, the wedding is prepared, the feast is ready, come. And the servants in Jesus' parable is supposed to represent the prophets. All of God's servants, all of God's prophets, uh, preachers that went uh, and, and to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. And their role was very simple, to go and tell uh, all those that were invited to the wedding, the feast is here, the, the wedding is here. Come to the feast, everything is made ready. The wedding banquet is ready. Uh, and the... The wedding banquet in Jesus' story is supposed to be that, that sweet fellowship of Jesus with his followers that's coming at the end of the age. When Jesus returns, he makes all things new. And, and that sweet fellowship that we as believers in Christ will share uh, with Jesus our King. Now, the people that were invited, the people that were originally invited, are supposed to represent the nation of Israel. That, that's, that's what Jesus' parable is, is really about. And so here's, here's where this parable is going. <clears throat> that preparations have been made. That, that the kingdom of God was at hand. And, and, and God's, the, the great way of access to God is now open. It's ready and it's going to be through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the original, uh, the original guest list, God's people, the nation Israel, were made aware. And so the, the prophets go and the servants go and, and they proclaim the time is now. The kingdom is at hand. God's, God is sending His Son, Jesus. And, and, and the way to God is opened through Him. And what did they do? They all make up excuses why they can't, why they can't go. He, um, look at verse 3. He sent out His servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. And so then in a picture in Jesus' parable of the grace and the mercy of God, he tells his servants, go back and ask again. Go back and ask again. 
Um, so the servants are sent out a second time after the first refusal. And, and to me, I see in this God's mercy, His long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And He tells His servants, you go and tell them, everything is ready and I've prepared the best of everything. Look at that. Verse 4, again He sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. In other words, I've, I have done everything. I've, I've, I've laid out the best of everything. God ha, has prepared and offers the best of everything. Please come. That's the invitation. But now we're given more detail into those who were originally invited but refused. And some ignored the invitation and some became hostile. Look, verse 5, they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. In other words, I don't have time to go to your son's wedding, king. I have better things to do. Now think about the, the, the ludicrousness of that. You are invited to the king's, the wedding of the king's son. The crown prince is getting married and you have something better to do. I don't think that would sit well with the king. Um, and look at verse 6, it gets worse from there. The rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. So not only did they refuse to go to the wedding, uh, refuse to go to the wedding banquet, but they, the ones that are bringing, you know, they killed the mailman that's delivering the invitation. I mean, that, that's literally uh, the way Jesus' parable is going here. And so the result of their rejection is that the king is going to judge them. He says to his servants, uh, uh, verse 8, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited are not worthy to go. Judgment is going to come on them. Jesus' desire is that you have eternal fellowship with Him. And I don't want you to lose this beautiful picture here that we are the bride. That, that, that He has not only invited you to be a part of the banquet, He has invited you to be the bride. There's, there's so many different pictures in Scripture about the kingdom and how we relate to God, and how we relate to Jesus. And some of them I, I really can relate to, like pictures of father and son. Uh, I, I, I can get my mind around that, because I always felt like I had a good relationship with my dad. I feel like I have a good relationship with my boys. And so you want to talk to me about being, you know, us being children of God, I can get my head around that. Me being the bride of Christ is really difficult. Um, so in, in our bedroom, we have a, and I found this online a long time, several years ago, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a print of a painting. It's called The Bride. And, and it, is, it is a picture of this bride. She's in white, and she is standing in the gates of heaven. And she has her little wedding bouquet. And the the... the there's, there's beautiful light, and way in the distance you can barely make out planet Earth. <laughs> but in heaven, there's angels there, and there's you know, this beautiful fountain, and there's, there's bright lights, and this beautiful bride is standing there, the bride of Christ, entering, entering the gates of heaven. And uh, we, we couldn't figure out where to put it in the house, so we had an empty wall in the bedroom, and I put it in the bedroom. And I'm glad we did because I, I like, I mean, it, it makes me happy to look at it. And uh, when we first got it, I mean, I just stare at the thing. It's just such a beautiful picture. And I, I tell Lisa, I said, that's you. It even looked like Lisa. I mean, it had dark hair, the whole deal. And I, I would I would lay there in bed and I'd go, look, that's you. And she'd go, that's you too. <laughs> and it was so weird because I'm like, Okay, I really wasn't thinking about that, but whether my mind can get around it or not, the truth is 
I am a part of the bride of Christ. And you are a part of the bride of Christ if you know Jesus as your Savior. The preparations have been made uh, that, that for us to spend eternity with Jesus. We're not just invited to the banquet. We are the guests of honor. We are the bride. So there's the preparation. Then, then there is the, the invitation. The, the invitation. If you look in verse 8, he says, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. They didn't deserve to come. Now, why didn't they? Well, they had proven by their actions that they weren't ready. I mean, they weren't, they weren't deserving. They weren't worthy. Um, now, notice something. They were originally invited. So what, what, what made them, what deemed them unworthy was not their lifestyle before the invitation or their socioeconomic status. What made them unworthy was their rejection of the invitation. And don't forget, this is a parable about God's kingdom. So don't let it be lost on you that a person's worthiness to be a part of God's kingdom is solely based on their acceptance or rejection of God's invitation. So, again, this is supposed to be originally that were invited. They're supposed to be uh, the nation Israel. They rejected. And so now... The king says in verse 9, Go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So the servants go out into the highways, and they gathered all whom they found, bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. In other words, regard, they did not use moral quality as a criteria to, jo, to, to judge who comes and who not, who doesn't come. The only criteria is, are you willing to respond to the invitation? Not how good you are or how bad you are, but are you willing to come? The meaning, uh, so, so now the commoners and the ne'er-do-wells are now invited to this great wedding feast, and the meaning seems to be that now the way of salvation is open to the Gentiles. Jesus came, the, God's Son came, he, he was offered originally to the nation of Israel and they rejected. And now the, the way is open to everybody. Now the invitation is open to everyone. Jews, Gentiles, whoever will come. Regardless of, of their moral standing, whosoever will may come. And their worthiness is dependent on their response to the invitation. And that is the only criteria. The riffraff of the world wouldn't seem to be worthy of an invitation to come to the king's son's wedding, the wedding of the crown prince. I remember, how, I'm old enough to remember when Charles and Diana got married and what a big deal that was. I mean, it was all over the news and every, every little girl wanted to be like Princess Diana and have the storybook wedding and ride in their carriage. You know, I think her storybook wedding turned into a nightmare after a few years, but it was every girl's dream at, at, at that time. And to, to think that you would have commoners, ne'er-do-wells. They, they didn't go down to the, you know, the, the part of London that, you know, where... The, the drunks and the prostitutes hang out and say, hey, we want as many people at this wedding as we can get, so y'all come. Y'all come on. That's how they talk in London, you know. Y'all come. Uh, it would seem so counterintuitive. And yet, Jesus in his story said, the only requirement to come to the wedding is to be willing to accept the invitation. God's desire is for the banquet hall to be full. 
God's desire is that the kingdom would be full. And the way of salvation is open to you now and to me now. But you prove your worthiness by how you respond to it. And so now the most unlikely candidates can now be part of the celebration. When we got married, we, we got married in Tennessee because that's where Lisa's from. Um, and so I'm from Texas. And so all my friends and from Texas, if I, you know, I was told, hey, I'm getting married in Tennessee, they're just like, I ain't going to Tennessee. I ain't going to. So my, my, my groom party, whatever, basically was my dad, who was my best man, and my two brothers and my brother-in-law composed my, my groom party. You don't call it a groom party. I don't. Groomsmen. They were my groomsmen. And... Uh, so we're so after the wedding, you know, you, you, you cut the cake and you do all the, the goofy little things you do at the reception. And so then, then it's time to throw the bouquet. Well, Lisa has all her friends there because she's from Tennessee. So all these eligible young women there all gathering around to catch the bouquet, you know, and it's it's a big deal. So then it comes time. So the next thing is you're supposed to like throw the garter or, or flip the garter or whatever you do. Um, that sounds risque, but it really was. It's not as bad as it sounds. Um, so anyway, so I'm standing there, and literally there's like one kid, and he's like the ring bearer, and he's like seven years old standing there. And the, the photographer, he's trying to take a picture of this. He's like, well, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. This is going to look terrible in the picture. And, we're, and he's like, okay, any eligible bachelors, come on up here, we need you, you know. So they get like, you know, one of her like, Uncles, it's like 90, you know, and he's up here. And he's like, no, that's still not enough. And so finally they get like my brothers who are married. Now my brother, you think I'm a nut? My oldest brother, I mean, you know, I, I would, you know, I would be like, uh, you know, I can't think of a serious person right now in my head. But anyway, I, my, my brother would, would, would put me to shame as, as far as goofiness. And so, he, now he's got, now he, they couldn't afford to, to fly everybody to Tennessee. And so he just gets on the plane and flies up there and leaves a wife and four kids at home. And, and so he's, he's there and he's like in the front. And so we have a wedding picture now of the, me tossing the garter with my, my brother. Granted, his wife and four kids at home and he's, literally diving for this garter. I'm like, man, you're way too excited about, about you know, trading up in wives or something there. It's a little scary. But I look back and I go, the most unlikely candidate is, you know, the most unlikely people. Of all the people you would expect to be in that group, now can be a part of it. We, we are not the most likely candidates to be the bride of Christ. And yet, the way is open to us. The door is open to us through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And then finally, Jesus wraps up his little parable by talking about the celebration. The, the celebration. And he adds this little part, and it's, it, at first it's a little bit confusing, um, because he talks about the, this the great banquet is taking place. The great celebration is taking place. And this one guy shows up in street clothes, basically. Because the, 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 the king has provided wedding garments for, for everyone. There's a dress code at this, at this uh, wedding banquet, which you would expect the son of the king's getting married. There's probably a dress code at this reception, at this banquet. And this guy just shows up in regular street clothes. And the king comes by and says, what are you doing here? Why aren't you dressed like you're supposed to be dressed? And it says he was speechless. Now, here's what we're supposed to get out of that. That there is a proper attire to be a part of the wedding feast of Jesus. And you must, to, to be admitted in, you must be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because if you try to come 
to the party in your own righteousness, you're going to be just as this man was, speechless. And Jesus is going to come to you and say, why are you here in your own filthy rags of righteousness? And you know what? We will be speechless. It wasn't just a question of his dress. It was a, a total disrespect of the king by the man. The man's problem wasn't that he showed up uninvited. Oh, he was invited. The problem was that he showed up unprepared. And many will, will stand before God all that, on that day and their problem will not be that God didn't want them or God didn't invite them. <clears throat> the problem will be that they came unprepared, dressed in their own righteousness rather than the righteousness of Christ. Speechless he was. And I told you that Casting Crowns was my second favorite group, my all-time favorite group, and they're not touring anymore, but my all-time favorite group was Third Day. And I want you to hear the words of one of their songs. What are you going to do when your time has come and your life is done and there's nothing you can stand on? What will you have to say at the judgment throne? I already know the only thing I can say is I trust in Jesus, my great deliverer, my strong defender, the Son of God. I trust in Jesus, blessed Redeemer, my Lord forever, the Holy One. Is that what you say? What will you say when you're, when you're standing before Almighty God. What are you going to say? All I can say is I trust in Jesus. Dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. Look at verse 13. The king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, eternal judgment is just as real as eternal reward. Everybody wants to hear a sermon on heaven and nobody wants to hear one on hell. But hell is just as real a place as heaven is. Heaven, <laughs> this, is a, this is something that's been said over and over again, but it's true. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Are you ready tonight? I uh, <laughs> so was thinking about our wedding. So Lisa got two wedding showers out of the deal because her church in Tennessee gave her a wedding shower. And then I was very active in a church in Wonsahatchee, and so my church wanted to do something for us, and so they gave her a wedding shower as well. Now, we got married back in the book, the good old days. In the good old days <clears throat> when women went to showers and men stayed home, and I tell you what, I'm, I love the good old days. I, I just, uh, I, you know, showers are something you send your wife to, you know. Uh, there's, there's a push now uh, in some groups and circles that, you know, let's make it inclusive and we'll have men. I don't want to be that inclusive. I don't, you know, I'll send, I'll be represented by my wife going. But it, in those days, in the good old days, what you did was, was it, the women showed up. And then like at the end of it, like the last 20 minutes of it or something, the, the groom-to-be was supposed to show up. And he was supposed to, you know, the bride-to-be was supposed to show all of, you know, this is what all I got and this is who gave me this and oh, isn't this pretty and this will upgrade and, you know, the breakfast nook or whatever, you know. And then you're supposed to ooh and all over it and, you know, make a big deal like, oh, this is... I've always wanted one of those. What is that again? Oh, yeah. You know how, all that good stuff, you know. So, so that's like part of the stuff. So this is going on, all right. So I know I'm supposed to show up at certain, certain time and ooh and all over the gifts. Okay, so during that weekend, during that weekend, like my uncle shows up. Now you got to understand, everybody has that crazy uncle. My uncle, R.O., wrote the book on Crazy Uncle. He, <laughs> he worked shrimp boats 
and sometimes oil boats down around Galveston and Freeport, down around the Texas coast. So he would be gone like six months at a time. And he would come back to shore with a pocket full of money paid out in cash. <clears throat> and he would get, get a bus ticket and he would just go from one relative to the other till he wore out his welcome there. And we were kind of like on that circuit. And it happened to be our time that crazy Uncle R.O. was at our house the weekend of the shower. Now he's got no car. I don't even think he had a driver's license. He, so, you know, I heard a comedian say one time there's a, drip, a difference between a drunk and an alcoholic because the, alcohol, the, uh, the drunk don't have to go to all them old meetings. Well, Uncle R.O. was a drunk because I never known him to go to any meetings. But, but he, would, he would take that pocket full of money and he would drink it up. And so you had this, this guy, and he, he only had three or four, you know, changes of clothes. And, I, you know, like he's been on a shrimp boat for six months. And I don't know that he laundered his clothes on the shrimp boat. So he comes, you know, he must have smelled kind of like Jonah, you know, the belly of a whale. When he, when he got to the house, drunk as a skunk, he had like old worn out blue jeans with, with the, cuff, the, the cuff, big cuffs turned in the bottom where, where his, you know, up to about his calf. And, and no socks and boat shoes. No belt, but he had a rope. Like Jethro Bodine, he had a rope. I'm not making this up. Had a rope tied around his, to hold his britches up, tied in a knot. Had a baseball hat that looked like he'd been out in the cow pasture for about a month that the cows had run all over and whatever else might happen in a cow pasture. All on this hat. And instead of like forming the bill like any sane person would do, he just like crunched it. So it's like, like a rooftop, you know. And so he's, he's sitting there. And so he's, I say all that to say he's been there for like a week. Everybody stood about as much RO as they can stand. Well, he doesn't have any way to go anywhere. So his next in the circuit would be my grandmother's house or, or his mother's house. In Palestine, two hours from Waxahachie. So he's sitting around. I'd go to Palestine if I could find a rod. And everybody just sitting there looking. And I'm like, I got this shower to go to in a little bit. I'm not saying anything, you know. And they're all kind of looking at me because nobody wants to drive him to Palestine. Nobody wants to put him in their car and drive him two hours. And so he says it again. I'd go to Palestine if I had a rod. And finally I'm like, I'll take you to Palestine. But I got to go to this shower first, okay? I mean, it's very important. It, it, for me to be at this shower at this time. But after the shower, I'll take you to, to Palestine. So he goes, okay, well, I guess I'll just ride up there with you. So I, I, at this point, I'm still thinking he's going to like, like sit in the car till I do all my oohs and ahs, and then we'll load him up. And, you know, Lisa had met Uncle Aro before. because You know, I mean, like the good, the bad, and the ugly, honey, you're in it for, you know... This is part of the deal, you know. So I wasn't that concerned about, you know, her running, screaming into the night, you know. But, but my church family had not seen a, a Uncle R.O. So we drive up there, you know. And I'm still thinking everything's going to be all right. I get out and he goes, man, it's hot in the car. I'm going to think I'm going in the shower with you. Oh, uh, okay. So we go in and we sit down in these little chairs. And here's all the little church ladies. And, and they're, all, they're all, like every, all the little church ladies in every little church, the little church ladies. And so they're all dressed in like, like the women wear in their the shower, especially back in those days, you know. They, they're all dressed in their little dresses and they're sitting there and they're eating their little crumpet sandwiches and whatever it is they do at those showers and all this. And they're sitting there. And here's, and I'm sitting here, and here's Uncle Aro. And he's, you know, he's, he's, been drinking all day, so he's three sheets to the wind, as my dad would say. Hadn't sh he's one of those, he has a beard like, I don't, I'm not really trying to grow a beard, I'm just too lazy to shave kind of deal going on. This goofy hat, 
rope around his waist, and he's sitting there, and about that time, he rears back and belches because he's been drinking a... And I swear, I thought, oh, Lord, if you could just, like, find it in your will to just let the earth open up and swallow me whole, I'd never ask for another thing. But he looks over at me, and he goes, I feel a little uncomfortable here. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable here too. He, and then he goes, but this was, this was the craziest thing. He goes, he goes, but I don't know why I feel that way. I've got as much right to be here as anybody. And I wanted to say, no, you don't. It's not your wedding. You're not invited to the shower. You're not invited to the wedding. You're not invited to the party. What makes you think you have any right to be here? I thought a lot about that afterwards. And I thought, you know, I think there is a great number of people that have that attitude with God. That they're going to stand before Almighty God on that day, clothed in their own filthy rags of righteousness. And I promise you, our righteousness is just as repulsive to God as my Uncle R.O.'s demeanor was to me. And we're going to rear back on that day and we're going to say, well, I feel a little uncomfortable up here, but I guess I got as much right to be here as anybody. And Jesus is going to say, no, you don't. You never, I never knew you. And, you know, it's no wonder that they would be uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable around God and His people now. Here's what I never understood. Why is it that lost people who reject the offer of salvation by Jesus, who want nothing to do with God and His people here on this earth, in this life, think for any reason that they are going to spend eternity with God and His people in the life to come. You don't have time for God and His people in this life. Don't expect Him to have a spot for you in the life to come. He ends verse 14 by saying this, Many are called, but few are chosen. You know what that really, how I understand that? I believe Jesus is saying this. There are many invitations that are sent out, but only those who RSVP are attending the wedding. Many, many are called. There's a lot of invitations that go out. But the time to RSVP for the wedding is right now. Jesus tells His own disciples shortly before his death let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you and I go to prepare a place for you see that's wedding language the groom would have gone and prepared a place for his bride I go to prepare a place for you Jesus said and where I'm if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's love language that Jesus has for us. Now where I'm going, you know, in the way you know, he says. And one of his disciples said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus, of course, says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What a beautiful wedding picture of our wedding to Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you prepared? I know you're invited. Have you RSVP'd today? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the wonderful offer of salvation and the beautiful picture of the kingdom that we see in this parable of Jesus. Lord, please speak to us now in this invitation time. Touch our hearts, Lord, and lead us, God, to the decisions you'd have us to make. These things we pray in the name of Jesus.